Alrighty, we are ready to get started today. How is everyone doing out there? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn. Thank you very much for tuning in to listening to us here today at the Focus Compounding Podcast at Jeff Gannon mm-hmm. on Twitter. Yep. How's it going over there? It's going well at Focus Compound. <laughs> there you go. Not plural, not no. ing, just Focus mm-hmm. Compound. Focus Compound. I think uh, there's not enough characters or something like that, so I had to... Oh. I had to stick to that or something. But I am I am doing great. Thank you very Good. much for asking. We hope everyone is having a great day or a great start to your day, wherever you are in the world. Um, of course, this is the audio part of our business. If you do want to get access, full access to our website where individuals write about ideas and there are a bunch of other investment ideas on there. We have a growing database of probably 50 to 60 different mm-hmm. um, stocks that have been written up within the past year on the on the website. Feel free to go to focuscompound.com. And if you do sign up, if you do like some money off on your final purchase. Mm-hmm. I'm not here to say whether you do or don't. Use the podcast promo code, and they'll take $10 off the price indefinitely as long as you stay a member and per the month. promo code is the word podcast. It is the word podcast. Yeah. So today we're going to be talking about something we've never talked about at all on the podcast. Okay. And it's macroeconomic data. Macroeconomic. So okay. macro stuff. Mm-hmm. And probably a lot of people listening that are listening to our type of podcast right. probably don't follow anything macro related, I okay. would assume, um, because obviously we're more uh, business analysts than, I guess, like top-down type analysts. Right. Um, so do you do you ever think about anything macro related or do you ever like consider anything macro related? I mean, I know when we talk about, like when we talked about Timberland, mm-hmm. I guess you could say some, maybe there's some more macro that went into that type of company, maybe. Sure. Learning about like well, I mean, the like price inflation. of Timberland and, and inflation yeah, sure. and stuff like that. Yeah, housing and, and inflation were the issues with that, yeah. Sure, but how do you typically, I mean, like, do you ever spend time on it? Do you ever spend time thinking about anything macro related? I know you don't care about, I mean, you probably care about interest rates in some regard, mm-hmm. I guess, on how you weigh certain decisions for opportunity costs and stuff like that. But what do you, like, do you ever think about macro? I think very little about macro, and here's something you don't know about me probably. I did briefly go to college and uh, took macroeconomic theory as well as many other economics college courses, uh, and uh, I still do not care about macroeconomic things generally and couldn't tell you. I mean, it was uh, one of the most boring courses I've ever taken in my life. Hopefully Ray Dalio's not listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I th- the reason I don't think a lot about macroeconomics is – uh, well, there's two reasons. Okay, one, um, it's usually a small part of what matters to the business that you're looking at. Mm-hmm. And two, there's usually too many other people thinking about it. Uh, three is the complexity of it. So you try to keep things, you try to spend a lot of time on things that are important, that are like um, persistent, you know, um, that are that um, uh, are going to stay the same for a long time and that you can predict in some way. Uh, and especially those things about some bit of information that uh, other people don't have, right? And the thing is, you're going with macroeconomics, you're studying exactly what everyone else is looking at. And it's likely to be less important to the company than, than company-specific issues. So in almost all cases, it's much less useful to look at macroeconomic stuff than it is to look at the spend that same time in the company itself. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't look at some macroeconomic things. I've certainly... Looked at um, looked at cruise lines and airlines because I thought that um, oil was very overpriced at like a hundred dollars on uh, or more on Brent, um, and so I thought, well, what can I do? Well, I can look for for companies that consume a lot of oil. Uh, when some housing related stocks were cheap, that got me to uh, be really interested in Hunter Douglas, which makes um, uh, you know curtains and blinds and things like that. Um, I got interested in banks because interest rates were uh, the Fed funds rate was at zero percent, uh, almost zero percent at the time. So did you take a top down? So is that you taking like a top down approach and then going to find an investment from there? Like yeah, a but top it's down not, opinion and right, then go to find a company. But, but I don't think of it as an opinion because the Fed funds rate was near zero. Yeah, well, yeah. Oil was at a hundred or something. So I'm saying in the future, will oil tend to be less expensive than it is now. Yes. Will the Fed funds rate tend to be higher than it is now? Yes. Will housing starts tend to be higher than they are now? Yes, because it was the bottom of housing starts basically. Yeah. So all I did is look is something a couple standard deviations away from normal or something. Yes, it's far off the trend. So let me look at what could benefit from just uh, uh, change back to the general trend that you have in the, in this um, uh, you know in whatever metric you're looking at there, right? So it's not trying to predict will housing starts go up a lot and when, but just that they're abnormally low, 
so look at things that would benefit from you know you know because people might generally they all were based on people pricing in the current situation instead of um the likely future mm -hmm. so i mean i've talked about this before a little bit but i don't believe that the current market price for an asset or something like that is more useful than an average of the past market prices so for something like oil uh, an average of each of the last 30 years market prices i think is more um, useful than just relying on today's market price now today's market price presumably should incorporate information uh, that those other 29 in the series didn't but all of them are wrong to some extent and by averaging out all the different uh you know two years ago people were trying to predict what oil prices were sure. so oil prices were telling you what they should be in the future and they're telling you now uh each of them could be wrong in different ways but i take long-term averages of things mm -hmm. uh, and i'm only interested in in like when we talk about a macroeconomic bet or something it's when it's a few probably a few standard deviations so like far ex from extreme point yeah i think with the oil i said it should be 30 to 70 dollars a barrel real uh, you know, inflation adjusted. Um, that's a very big range. I didn't have an opinion. If it was 70, okay, that's normal. If it was 30, that's normal too. Yeah. Uh, either of those could be reasonable. And within any five-year period, you might hit b one or both of them. Um, so I didn't have a prediction more specific than that. I just thought when it was uh, at the prices that it was at at the time, that was really eating into the earnings of a company like Cruise Lines. And people were kind of incorporating that as being something that would keep down the returns on equity for a long time. So I thought, okay, that's interesting. Fed funds rate, you know, uh, what's it more likely to be in the long-term future, 3% or 0%? That's all you have to decide. Sure. Right? And in terms of the banks, it hasn't, what I've um, sort of bet on hasn't been useful right now because the, the yield curve is very flat. So what actually happened when the Fed funds rate went up is that you end up with a pretty flat yield curve, which isn't as useful to banks. So if I was trying to predict the future that actually happened, I didn't do a very good job of it. But the Fed funds rate will be higher in the future than it was then, and that's kind of the number that matters more. No, I think that's a good way of, of looking about it, or looking at it. In, in the big uh, the book, um, the big mistakes by Michael yeah. something B starts with mm -hmm. B. Um, <laughs> sorry if you're listening, Michael B. <laughs> something like that. I think he said that uh, the biggest takeaways from all the investors that he sort of profiled in that book was that they all control what they can control, right. and and that's not necessarily having such a macro opinion or like because you can't control that they just focus more so a lot of the successful people focus on the actual businesses themselves sure and it can also be helpful just to know what things to avoid mm -hmm. so obviously i wasn't going to buy anything that depended on the price of oil i was gonna be you know because i thought the price of oil was really high yeah i'm not going to buy anything that depends on really low borrowing costs if i think the prices are abnormally low um things like that how do you think about inflation and how that relates to investing. Uh, I've looked at long-term past records of uh, inflation. And um, generally people, so a few things. One, the inflation rate today. So what matters to you as an investor long-term is the long-term rate of inflation. And today's inflation rate isn't helpful in knowing that. So same with the Fed funds rate. So you t people tend to assume that the inflation you're seeing now is normal and is likely to be the inflation rate long into the future. Uh, in reality, if you look at the past, um, when inflation was running at, you know, um, in, so let's take the 1960s. So people would have assumed that inflation would be pretty low as it was in the early 1960s. But 15 years later, it was incredibly high. Um, there's nothing in the inflation that was present then or in the Fed funds rate or anything that would suggest that that was going to happen. So I'm thinking in the long term, it, people will expect it to be like it is now, but there's no reason to make that expectation. I think if inflation was 0% or 10%, I think if you're making a 15-year prediction, neither of those is more helpful in telling you what it'll be. Sure. Um, just because it's it's at that level now. So I don't think it's helpful that way. Um, in terms of looking at the Fed funds rate and things like that, the Fed has a um, – the, the Fed claims that it's not uh, – that it's not, I guess, biased either way on 2%. So it wants 2%, but it would be just as happy with 1 as 3 that the past record shows that's not true, that they would rather have three than one. So we'd expect that whatever target the Fed um, uses, they're actually, you're going to get inflation higher than that in the long run. But you don't really even like incorporate sort of that into an investing decision at all. When we talk, I always use 3%. Yeah. No, I mean, as a long-term thing, 
Uh-huh. No, we can use 2% if the company benefits incredibly from inflation yeah. somehow or something. Mm-hmm. But no, I, w- I would definitely expect – you shouldn't – no one listening to this should expect less than 3% inflation long-term during their uh, investing lifetime. No, definitely not. But I'm saying like you don't really – weigh on that a lot in your investment process at all i don't think so but a lot of stocks that i bought benefit from inflation or are more protected against inflation uh-huh. i'm very aware that most stocks are pricing in they're not being inflation so that's like a risk that you're taking and not being compensated for sure so i want to i'm a little more hesitant about those um so i would want to avoid that more than than some people might um so i don't think it's a big thing but i think it's nice to get something for free sure no, totally. so if i think that something's priced in real dollars and inflation is like one percent of the time i'm buying it people are incorporating basically one percent into their model they're not thinking well what if it goes to five mm-hmm. but five is almost as likely as one you know both of those should be about equally likely what about interest rates do you think about like how debt be, could become more expensive for companies if rates mm-hmm. rise or how do you sort of think about that? I just kind of think, I guess where we are in the cycle or something, if you want to call it a cycle, I don't really think about it as a cycle, but you know what? It's like Howard Marks's new book, mastering the market cycle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Howard Marks memos are very good about those things. And, um, the, all you need to know is the things that are really out of whack one way or the other. Yeah. So things that might be really cheap, you could go look at, and because they're really beaten down and hated and then things that are uh, areas to worry about so i like you know um i would be worried about certain kind uh, you know i would be cautious about uh an example is like sub uh not just subprime but but auto loans recently i was cautioning people to be careful about that for a while because of the way that um interest rates work where they're low um, people had a tendency to uh, want slightly, didn't want to go out to get yields. They didn't want to um, uh, buy bonds and things that were 10 to 30 years. So they wanted things that were five years or something, but or three years. But uh, there was, if it's not risky, they're not getting a lot of yield on that. And so, you know, people would buy into things that are basically packages of, of sub, uh, subprime auto loans and things like that. You know, and you could see that that's not good what's happening there. Um, I wrote about a bank. I briefly mentioned bank in one of the memos as saying that I thought it was a potentially much riskier bank than Wells Fargo. I won't say the name of the bank, but um, I do. And you can see by reading about it that it is risky in some of the things that they're doing in that as long as you are in an expansion like we've had for such a long time, then it doesn't run into problems. But it's doing a lot of construction lending in markets that it doesn't gather deposits in um, and that it hasn't historically made construction loans in. And that's a pattern that you see a lot with banks that fail. So is because what they get loose with their lending practices. Well, yeah. Uh, construction loans are one thing that they tend to do and especially construction loans in States that they, um, aren't originally from for, for all sorts of different things, whether it's like, for instance, the auto loan thing, uh, a big part of it is that there are comp you compare what companies who've been in the business for 30 years or more say, and how cautious they are. With banks who had never been in the business before and were buying up a lot of these, um, uh, you know, like so an office would package together like 60 of these loans or something and then sell them off to them, uh, what they were saying. And the people who had never made these loans before were the ones who were saying that they were safe. And the people who had been making them for a long time were saying this is some of the riskiest, um, but you know, loans that we've had for like a vintage. So, you know, you see that pattern a lot over and over again. Mm-hmm. Uh, you see the most like marginal companies in terms of being the last, the last ones in will lose the most money usually. So the, those that come, who haven't made these loans before, they come into an area and make these loans for the first time. They're the ones that are going to lose like everything. And the ones who've been there forever will have some fallout from it, but they're the ones to pay attention to, Sure, you know, as being safer. Yeah. So, I mean, I looked at like um, Hawaiian banks and one Hawaiian bank um, basically wiped out almost all the equity value in their company by making a lot of loans on the mainland. And that's a very – and Bank of Hawaii, when it ran into trouble, did the same thing. Um, that's a very clear sign of something bad. They should be making loans in Hawaii. They shouldn't be making loans in other places. So, And construction loans are another sign. So, yeah, you see things like that. You're aware that um, – I mean, you think about the housing bubble or something. Mm-hmm. As long as house prices keep going up, there's no problem. Sure. That kind of, it all works out great. Yeah. yeah. And you can see that with – you know, this expansion has been going on for such a long time. That for some things, um, they're, they can look not risky for a long time. So if you are making um, loans that require people to stay employed, for instance, 
Well, unemployment's gotten lower and lower for a lot of years. So there's been no uptick in unemployment. So you've never tested um, the kinds of loans that they're making, right? So I think you need to rely on a very long-term past, mm-hmm. um, like oil prices. So OPEC, that was the oil embargo was now 45 years ago. So you should be using a 45-year long record of where oil prices were to get ideas about the variation you could have in oil prices, uh, what a normal oil price is in real terms, things like that. You shouldn't be using what this most recent year is or five years or whatever, which is what people tend to do. Do you ever think about where we're trading in the market today Mm -hmm. and like the S&P 500 and, oh, things are overheated because of that? Yeah. I mean, a lot of people slapped on a chart from like they'll show like um, the bubble, the Internet bubble crash. And then they'll show like it's the J.P. Morgan Mm -hmm. guide to the markets. Google it. And a lot of salespeople use it. Um, They'll show like the uh, J.P. or the 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 bubble crash and then they'll show 2008 and then they show that whoa now at the present we're up like 300 some odd percent or whatever okay. we are and that oh things must be overpriced because you know on a, on that sort of basis we're so much further along uh yeah i think things are overpriced i've said that before but where do you draw that conclusion from um you can use things like the shiller p if you want to um you can use a lot of different measures i just look at I look at a lot of different stocks, so I would get the general impression that they're overpriced. Uh-huh. Um, but, but you've never not invested because of that, right? No. There, there's no reason not to invest just because the market's expensive. Mm-hmm. For one thing, how many of the stocks that I would buy are in an index? Sure. They're yeah. not. And, you know, you can always find, I only need, what, five or ten stocks or something? Mm-hmm. So you can find five or ten stocks out of, you know, a thousand or something or several thousand if you were looking at all public companies. Do you so, think that there's an inherent hedge too in that regard because you're not in an index and obviously you're buying companies that you believe are cheap? The com- Yeah, the companies I buy are less correlated to the market. That is true. Yeah. You know that historically. And if you care about things like beta, yeah, they have lower beta. Um, I don't know that that's that helpful in thinking about it because, like I said, because there's, they're not that correlated, I don't know that mm-hmm. using beta is that helpful. But, yeah, yeah, I think that's that's true. And uh, yeah, I, I, we've, I, we won't mention the exact stocks, but I've owned stocks before in the past that actually registers having negative beta or having beta very close to zero and stuff. Mm-hmm. But that's not an intention to get that. That's just something that's happened. Has happened. Yeah. Well, if you think the market's risky, then you obviously don't want to take on like market risk. Yeah. Um, I mean, if it if it had a beta of one and stuff, it would probably be trading like a lot of other stocks that I don't like. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, ninety percent of the stocks out there would I not buy them because they're too expensive? Yeah. Yeah, probably nine out of ten stocks. I so your feel for the market being a little bit more pricey comes from actually analyzing companies and coming across a lot of companies that seem overvalued. Yeah, generally, mm-hmm. I think that's true. Although I think something like the Schiller PE is very useful. I, I do. Some people doubt the Schiller PE and stuff, but I did a um, uh, research of my own back in two thousand six or something, which used the Dow instead of the S and P five hundred, and which used a um, uh, fifteen year uh, nominal. Uh, average instead of I guess the Schiller's ten year inflation adjusted, something like this. that. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and got very similar. And I didn't include dividends because I thought, well, that's unfair because obviously a cheap market tends to have higher dividend yield. So you just want to use the point growth mm-hmm. right in the down uh, because obviously if you start with a higher dividend yield, your returns are going to be higher. Sure. So that's not really fair as to mm-hmm. you know just apples apples. Yeah. So I mean, so it is true. You should buy when the dividend yield is higher, but. The point was kind of if if the stock um, will the stock market won't do as well, um, and that showed very much the same as the Schiller. Um, so if you're going to be in the market for thirty years, it makes no difference. But if you're going to be in the market for a year, um, there's a much higher chance. Almost all the great year, truly, almost all the great years in stock market history that are like incredibly great come in very very cheap markets. If you don't believe me, look at what stocks are turned in the early 1930s. The kinds of stocks that we like best, the really small ones. Some of those were doing 100% a year in the 1930s because of what had happened in, in 1929. And, mm-hmm. and there was an, another downturn a couple of years later. But throughout the 30s, they were doing really well. And you only get those kinds of huge returns usually in, at coming off of really, really um, cheap markets. But the biggest thing that I found is that uh, people project EPS growth, thinking that it's going to be different based on the recent past. And what I found is that it was like perfectly normally distributed, the odds that it would just fall on either side of a trend line, 
that there's no sort of pattern in terms that people are seeing a pattern. Like for instance, in the um, before the 2008 crash, at least what I used with the um, Dow uh, said that it was slightly above the trend you'd expect to a lot above the trend you'd expect every year for like 13, 14, 15 years in a row. Uh-huh. Just luck. But that's just luck because if you extend it back to 75 years or whatever, there's streaks almost that long. And it, the truth is if you were flipping a coin, you can get streaks that are about that long. And and But people believe that something has changed in the economy and stuff, and people try to explain it by saying that things have changed and everything. And there's just it's just not a – that's just not really there. I mean, there's a normal earning power for it that's based on the sales and stuff, and you're not long term going to see a different uh, result. So, buying in cheap markets is much more effective. Sure, but in the long run, it has almost no difference. So, if you're going to hold stocks for 30 years, like if you want to predict where the S&P 500 will be in 30 years, it doesn't really matter where your starting point is. It's just that you have 30 years of compounding. That's what's going to determine it. And then, on average, it's going to average out. Over that 30-year time frame. Well, price isn't that important. Like, think about it. If it needs to make a price adjustment, it can make it at 1% a year for 30 years. Sure. Yeah. That barely affects your returns. Mm-hmm. But if you go out 10 years, yeah, it's huge. The impact is huge. But what's your alternative? You're still, in many cases, going to outperform uh, bonds, even when the market's pretty expensive. Um, and then you're going to try to figure out cyclically when to get in and out of things. I think that's pretty difficult. But... You know, but I wouldn't own the S and P five hundred, so I don't think it's an important, you know, question that way. Uh-huh. I don't see the stocks I own as being the S and P five hundred. No, right. But if I if it was a question of owning the S and P five hundred, no, I would not be one hundred percent in the S and P five hundred right now. That would be not a good decision. Well, you've you've talked about it that you would, you think that over the next five to ten years, you think Timberland would probably be a, a better asset than holding the S and P five hundred. Oh yeah, well, spe- for especially people listening to this, if you already own stocks and stuff, yeah, fifty percent. Um, stocks at fifty percent Timberland, yeah, I like that a lot better than a hundred percent stocks at today's price. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that's actual diversification that you can get from it. Sure. We talk about diversification a lot, but most people are diversifying through like thirty stocks or through owning different mutual yeah. funds. That's not going to get you any. We still own the market, right? Yeah, it's not going to go up and down with the market. It's not getting you anything. But owning something like you know long term zero coupon bonds or something, or owning Timberland or things like that, that has a real diversifying effect. Um, yeah, and Timberland is one of the few things that diversifies while having good. Um, uh, fairly good returns. Like uh, Timberland can keep pace with an expensive market, yeah. But overall, stocks are better. And personally, I would want to own one hundred percent stocks rather than Timberland. I just want to be the one to pick those stocks. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And that's the difference right there. Yeah, and if you dollar cost average over time, I think you'll do much better in stocks than Timberland too. I just think that if you go and put all your money in today and you've never owned a stock before, I have doubts that you'll definitely outperform Timberland. I don't know that you will. Because I think it's expensive today at the stock market. I would agree. But that doesn't mean that there's not opportunity out there still. So. No. It's just knowing where to look. Yeah, I think for the individual listening to this, the best asset is stocks over time. So you should be spending all your time trying to develop expertise in stocks. Mm-hmm. And, le- and fishing in inefficient type stocks where the most inefficient pr- price stocks yeah. are. Yeah. But even if you, so either you have to pick those sorts of stocks or sometimes you have to sit on some cash, which is fine. But you're always looking – the thing you're always looking for is a good stock because that's what you try to learn the most about. That's what can be the most useful because having skills and knowing what the best bonds are and, and different asset classes and stuff, it's not that useful because it, you know timing those things can get you a few percent better. But it's not what you can get long term from picking the right stocks mm-hmm. and from being in stocks generally. No, I think that's I think that's good. I think that's a good place to stop. Any other thoughts on the topic? Nope. I don't think so either. Well, we want to thank everybody for tuning in and listening to us here today at the Focus Compounding Podcast. If you do want to get access to Jeff's memo, go to focuscompounding.com on the homepage. You'll see a spot to enter in your email where you receive a weekly, I was going to say monthly, a weekly, weekly. topic mm-hmm. from Jeff on a 500-plus uh, word yeah. memo on an investing topic or investing thought process or just a different way to think about investing sometimes. And it's never on an investing idea, but it is always on some sort of principle of some sort. Mm-hmm. Other than that, we want to thank everybody for tuning in. Thank you very much for listening, and we will see you in the next podcast.